Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. That my friend Tim Detellis is with us today. Tim and I have been friends. Our families have done ministry together for over 30 years. Uh, new missions is something that we believe in as a church. We support them every single month. Uh, we, they support, we support the mission in Haiti and Dominican Republic. The mission strip is with New Missions. Tim Detellis is the, the head of that organization. And so we thought it would be great today as we're getting ready to, to do that mission trip and connect with New Missions a little bit more to have him in today, share a message with you guys. We're staying with the same series that we're talking about in the book of Genesis. Today we're going to look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. And then tonight, come on back out for a great comedy night. So would you welcome to the stage my friend Tim to tell us. Put your hands together for Pastor Mike. Yeah. It's great to be back at Family Church. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, those of you that are joining online, welcome. And uh, pour me an espresso. We are going to rock out the second service. Y'all doing good? Man, y'all looking good. Gosh, just a few weeks after Easter, this place is packed out. Unbelievable. Put your hands together for yourselves. Unbelievable. Wow. I do want to give you a, a brief update on missions as we kick off today's service. And I want to thank you for your generosity here at Family Church. Every time that you give, your generosity is changing lives through our mission in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And I want to give you a first-hand update all the way from Haiti. My brother Charlie is there right now, and he just shot this video for us today. Let's take a look at this clip. Hello, this is Charlie Tutelas in Haiti. And yesterday we worked all day long receiving 2,000 sacks of rice here in our warehouse in Leo Gan. We really thank God for this provision. It's a quality rice grown in Pakistan. Um, we use 750 sacks of rice per month. So this rice represents food for over two months. We also have cooking oil and beans coming in. I travel throughout the country, Haiti, and I see the poverty of the country. Uh, Haiti truly has economic needs. And it is vital that we keep feeding the children here in Haiti. So I just thank you for your prayers and support. It's a, I always say that it's a privilege and a pleasure to be serving God here in Haiti. Haiti is a great country. The people in Haiti love their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. And I got to put into context for you all, there's a lot of crazy going on in Haiti. We have been there 41 years. Family Church has been in existence for 42 years. We have been partnered together since the beginning, your church and our mission. And while there is chaos in Haiti, today all of our churches gathered, 30 of them gathered to praise the Lord. Amen. And then on Friday, those churches met at one of our churches on the ocean, and 37 Haitians followed in believers' baptism to the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? And because of your giving, Charlie got that food in a country where you cannot do commerce and business in the capital city. We had food shipped in on a boat, and he met the boat in Maraguan, Haiti, with three transport trucks. We literally sent them $100,000, and they got that rice, and they brought it to our mission campus so all of our students will eat lunch each day. Isn't that a miracle? I mean, total miracle to the glory of God. Come up a little bit louder. You can clap a little bit louder for that, man. I'll tell you. Uh, I'm Italian, and food is my love language, so we clap at food, okay? <laughs> That's why I love hanging out with your pastor, Mike. Uh, last night we were having a, a meal together, and, you know, I, I kind of jokingly say, if you put me in front of tiramisu and some sausage, praise Jesus. You know, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> and so we had a good time uh, connecting. What I, what I love about your pastor, Mike, and I is uh, we grew up in a ministry home and a family that was sold out to Jesus in a crazy way. But when we get together, we're like brothers that can have conversations of courage. Repeat after me, Courage. Because in ministry, it takes a courage to go the distance. 
And today, that's really what today's message is about. We're going to kick off this message titled, The Call and the Cost. And uh, I am thankful to be here. But I do need to let you know, uh, if you're new to Family Church, come on back for some really great Bible preaching and teaching from your pastor, Mike, and the staff. They do an amazing job. I've enjoyed catching up on the series and hearing what's been going on. But this is kind of like story time with Tim. So I'm just going to sit back and relax. And we're going to have a good time together as we talk about the life of Abraham. And when we look at the history of Abraham, we have to go back to his upbringing. You know, we all have to remember where we came from, right? And, you know, Abraham's dad, just a good pagan man. (laughs) They were polytheistic and they would worship multiple gods and didn't have a one true God in their life. And here we have Abraham now learning to be obedient in his calling. There was a lot of rebellion and a lot of frustration, a lot of fighting between him and God over time. And we'll get into that story in just a moment. But when you look at the history of this family, you see that God wasn't given up on them, even when it may have looked like they turned their back on God. And maybe for all of us in this room, we can relate to that. We can relate to the fact that we weren't raised maybe in an environment that Jesus was Lord of the home. Or maybe you and I have had moments in our life that there were other gods that we were turning to, whether it was the bank account, the career, the retirement. And today God is asking us the question, just like he asked Abraham, and that is, will you believe in me and will you trust me? Will you follow me? And so the story of Abraham is really the test of all tests. Because really, God is really putting Abraham in a position where he's having to make a very clear decision. But if you look at the story of Abraham, there was a moment when Abraham wanted to take the controls in his own hand. And and some of us would call that like we want to have self-control. Not self-control as a resistance to a temptation, but self-control from the power to do what you want. And Abraham decided to do what he wanted, and they ended up having a child through his servant. Do you remember this part of the story? Because God said, I was going to promise you a child, but then they got impatient. I don't know about you, but I can get impatient. (laughs) And so Abraham does this act out of really a kind of a self-controlling nature. I'm going to take these things into my own hands. Unfortunately, in the process of doing that, It wasn't the lineage that God had planned. And after he has child with his servant is when God steps into the story and says, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham, father of nations. So this morning in this room, there's any of us, if you're watching online, any of us here in this room that has said or could say, yeah, I think I've made a mistake. I think I've done some things on my own. Hmm. after the mistake that you and I make, God can look at you and I and say, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm going to change your name. And then I'm going to send you out to fulfill the promise. Hallelujah. And that's what today's story is about. God tries us and tests us to determine what we believe Really? Well, I like to beg the question, you know, why doesn't God just kill the devil and get this whole thing over with? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, that'd be an easier solution, right? But it's really because God wants to know, do you know him? Do you surrender to him? Will you say yes to this call no matter the cost? And that is the story of Abraham today. And so today I want us to Ask this question, how do we trust God for his provision? How do we trust God for his provision? So I do fly often on airplanes, but I had a really crazy experience recently, and that was in a hot air balloon. Who invented this thing? I mean, you're standing in a wicker basket with a flame burning up the sky. No seatbelts. I mean, talk about regulation. There ain't no regulation. And I'm looking at my wife like, are you going to push me over? <laughs> what are we doing in here? <laughs> what is your intent of putting me in a hot air balloon? For the record, I had zero faith in this hot air balloon, okay? Zero. <laughs> I have more faith getting on an airplane, you know? 
And that's exactly where God sometimes puts you and me, is in a situation where our faith is going to be tested into what is called the unknown. Why? Because you and I find confidence in the predictability. We find confidence in knowing what's going to happen next, and so we do what we do out of a rhythm of understanding that we know the process and the plan and the procedure because predictability builds success. But a lack of predictability brings insecurity and fear. But see, there's a fine line between that. And the fine line between that is a surrender to God because God already has it figured out. And so we find this childlike faith and we step through that unknown territory. And we find what I like to call a supernatural confidence. Amen? Repeat after me, supernatural. You can't explain it, friends. It's like the meatball recipe. Nobody knows. It's supernatural. Only God can explain. Amen? By the way, the Italians in the room got that meatball reference, okay? (laughs) Come back tonight for the rest of the story on the meatball, okay? So how do we trust God for his provision? We have to surrender. What's next? We have to surrender the unpredictable. We have to surrender what we cannot see to God. And that's how we trust him for the provision. So I want to take you back in time to a moment in the mission of new missions in Haiti. And I was just a a young kid, we were camping out in tents for three months, and I remember as an 11-year-old boy, we decided to drill a well at our mission. We were living on the ocean down a three-mile dirt road, and we had no drinking water. Kind of important, don't you think? They began drilling, and at about 115 feet, they stopped, and all they got was this murky mud water, no water. Too close to the ocean is what we were told. Sorry, no water for you. How are we supposed to survive? We're living literally on an island down a three-mile dirt road in the ocean, and we have no drinking water. So we did whatever it took to find water. And I remember as a young boy, we would literally travel five miles one way to the closest well to fetch water. And I want you to hold on to that story in your mind for a moment. Because we did whatever it took to go find the resource so that we could survive. And we would commute five miles one way to a well to get safe drinking water so we could cook for the children in our schools. That we would have drinking water for us and the missionaries. That we would have water for bathing. Even though it was a challenge and it was difficult and there was pain and suffering in doing that. Literally a ten mile trek just to get water. Talk about a test. Are you willing to be a missionary under those circumstances? Are you willing to count the cost and say no matter what, you're going to still live there in Haiti with no drinking water? And we did. And we did. We trusted God for that provision, even though the water was far. So today, I want us to dive into this story of Abraham. And I want us to look at this scripture because this is really the basis of a test. No matter the cost, would Abraham follow God? Throughout this series in Genesis, you've heard this theme that God's way is the best way. Would you repeat that after me? God's way is the best way. One more time, nice and loud. God's way is the best way. And so Abraham, in this moment in time, In Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read this. It's on the screen, starting in verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, 
God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and took the knife to slaughter his son. Can't even fathom this. And I'm pausing because I lost my place. (laughs) But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Repeat after me, here I am. am. One more time, here I am. am. Let's remember that, okay? Here I am, he said. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. For your scripture today that is speaking to us, Lord. Heavenly Father, may we learn from Abraham's story of surrender and faith. But dear Lord, may we not just know it, but may we live it and obey it for your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So when does trust begin? When does trust begin? Here's Abraham following the voice of God to be obedient, to trust in something he cannot figure out himself, does not know what's next, but follows up to the mountain to sacrifice his son. So when does trust begin? I remember my four-year-old son was in the kitchen one day, and My mother-in-law was in from out of town, so I was praying and fasting. (laughs) And there she was having a dispute with me because my four-year-old son at the time wanted to plug into the electrical outlet an extension cord. And she was like, that's too dangerous for him. He's going to hurt himself. He shouldn't be playing with the electrical outlets. So as a dad, I got down on my knees and I looked at my son at four years old. And I said, Luke, I said, I'm going to show you how to plug in the electrical extension cord. And there I showed my son slowly how to put that into the wall and slowly how to remove it. And then something happened. My four-year-old son decided to go throughout the house (laughs) with his extension cord in tow and find all the electrical outlets and plug in the extension cord. I trusted my son. I gave him some instruction and off he went. And for you and I, we have to trust God before we even know the outcome. And little did I know that literally 20 years later, my son would invent a software and a device because of the beginnings of electrical cords that would control the LED lighting in car washes. And around the country, in Las Vegas, they do trade shows with his technology that control the LED lights inside car washes because my son programmed and coded the software and invented the device. But what you don't know is that he dropped out of college because he had some mental health issues. And as a child, I used to look at my son and I would say, ask God, try harder. And he found this tenacity to keep on learning and being self-taught with software programming and coding. But I didn't know what the outcome was going to be for him. But God did. God already knew. He ended up selling the technology to a company that he was building these devices for, and then 
So he got equity in the company, and then they hired him full-time to be their software director and engineer. It's an amazing story of God's provision. And when I think about tech and I think about how much influence that has in society, I reflect on what your church has been doing here with tech and AVL and sound and these digital screens. Your pastor and family church, did you know churches around the nation are looking at you to learn how to do this? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, you can put your hands together for it. What I love about that is it allows churches to have an impact in culture because those that aren't here yet are a media and tech-minded people. And so they come into church and they go, I get it now. I can, I can connect with this. I, thank you. And you're helping churches bring the gospel to people in ways that could never be done before. And your pastor, Mike, has been pioneering that and being a huge resource to churches. Amen? Yeah. Put your hands together. But I'm going to go a little bit further. Your pastor, Mike, is kind of like a geek and a nerd like my son. And little did he know, back when he was fooling around, plugging in stuff and doing techie stuff, that God would use him to influence churches all across this country. God already knew. Just like Abraham didn't know the outcome of going up on the mountain that day, but he was obedient to God and trusted him before he knew the outcome. When does trust begin? Abraham gathered the wood before he knew the outcome. It begins when we surrender to God. We surrender to God the outcome. When my son, I'll never forget the day I got the phone call. I'll just, we'll just have fun here, second service. First service didn't get this. I'll never forget, I was in, oh gosh, I was in Springfield, Missouri at a conference. The phone rings. Your son's been admitted to a mental hospital. He had a psychotic breakdown freshman year of college. I jumped on the first flight I could to Chattanooga. I don't know if anybody here ever has dealt with some mental health issues. I looked at my son trembling. There was fear he was going to take his own life. And I looked at my son. And I said, God's love for you is greater than any fear you feel. I didn't know the outcome, but God already did. My son met a girl at, at church through college ministry. If there's any parents here today and you have teenagers or students in your life, get them plugged into family church, okay? Let me tell you, the most healthy place for your kids is right here in this building. You hear me? And if you serve through any of the kids' ministry or the student ministry, college ministry, I just praise you today. I Seriously, I thank God for you and what you do for these students in this church. Amen? Put your hands together for them. My, my son met a girl at church, okay? Oh, praise Jesus for Sydney. At their wedding day, she wrote the vows, and she said, I knew that Luke would love me. Because if Luke could love God through his darkest of days, I knew that Luke could love me. If you're going through hurt and pain today, let me tell you something. God already has it figured out, and his love is greater for you. And so we surrender this to Jesus. We surrender it to God. Because he already knows the outcome. But when does the provision arrive? The crazy part about this story about Abraham, friends, and I keep moving further back if you notice because I like swinging like a swing set and I'm about, I'll swing off the stage in about two minutes. It's going to be fun. The amazing part about this story of Abraham is the provision. And the provision is who was to be sacrificed. It was Isaac, right? Think about this. Isaac was brought up to this mountainside by his dad and put on an altar to be killed. And when I read this story of Abraham and we celebrate Abraham's faith, we celebrate his calling, no matter the cost. But I pause and I look at Isaac and I go, what on earth did this kid go through? And at that time, he was a young adult, some 
estimate maybe in his early 20s, some estimate maybe in his late teens, but he's a young adult going through this crazy experience. What was his trauma? Now, I'm going to go on record. I don't care if this is being recorded, and I'm talking to family today. Y'all, y'all with me? We're family. We're going to have a little family talk, okay? Come in the family room. Let's sit down. Let's have a conversation. A few weeks ago, I'm sitting on a couch. My wife's next to me. And there's a therapist looking at me. The therapist says, wow, your, your, your birth story, your childhood story is one of the greatest stories of rejection and abandonment I've ever heard in 19 years. Your mother wanted to abort you. Just the, the trauma and then the health risks and all the crazy you went through. You have, you have childhood trauma. And I wanted to look at that therapist and say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. My birth is a miracle. Come on now. Look it. The story of Isaac is a miracle. The story of you, if you're breathing this morning, just raise your hand if you're breathing. Come on. If you're breathing this morning, you're a miracle. We all have trauma. I don't care who you are, where you're from, who your mama was, who your daddy is or isn't. We all have trauma. But let me tell you, there's a miracle in our story. And there's a miracle in the story of Abraham and his Isaac. And the miracle is Isaac. Pastor Mike and I were talking in between services, and we were getting emotional thinking about, look at the layers of trust that God interwove in this story, that there was trust from Abraham to God. A man who was raised in a pagan home, worshiping many gods, and he finally found the one true God. And now his son had to have trust in the father who would have trust in the one true God. If there's been trauma in your life, let me tell you where to solve it. Isaac, his name means to laugh. Go ahead and laugh at the devil. Go ahead and laugh at your trauma. I'm not going to let somebody put me in the prison that Jesus has set me free from. Amen? And I'm not going to let you live a life that says, hey, I'm not good enough for God. Because the day after that I, Abraham sinned against God and had a child from a servant, God changed his name and said, you are still going to be the father of nations. I'm going to now name you Abraham. So my question to you is, what's the name that God is giving you today? I look across this room and And I look at you, each of you, and I think, promise, 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 promise. Drama be gone. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Pain be gone. Let me laugh at that. Why? Because laughter is a medicine. It's going to heal me in Jesus' name. So Isaac gives us a testimony of a test that was passed. Why? To glorify who God is. Is God greater than your pain? Is God greater than my son's mental health issues? You better believe it. Does he have a good psychiatrist? Yes. Does he take meds? Yes. And I eat a lot of meatballs. So don't judge me. And I like my cannolis. Kind of chilled, a little chilled. I love you guys, you know that? We're not done yet. If you hear anything today, I want you to hear this. That the story of Abraham and Isaac didn't happen without sacrifice. And there has to be a sacrifice to God. But that doesn't come easy. That's the cost in this call. This church family and all that you experience when you walk in these doors didn't happen by accident. It happened by sacrifice. When your students or your kids get left in a room to be loved and shared the gospel to, it happens because of sacrifice. Because someone surrendered to the call and they don't care the cost. My brother Charlie on video, he shot that video in our warehouse that was rebuilt after an earthquake destroyed the original one. We could have said, we're done with Haiti. We lost all the buildings. Forget it. No, you rebuild. You find food on a boat. Are you with me? No matter the cost. Why? Because we're surrendered to the call. And that's who God is looking for. 
But, you know, in our culture, sometimes we just want things to be too comfortable and too easy. But God's saying, will you sacrifice for me? It makes me think of the boy with the two loaves. Y'all remember this story? The fish and the loaves. Remember this? This was like pre-Chick-fil-A days. But that's what it would have been like. It would have been like you showing up and you had your Chick-fil-A bag and somebody's like, hey, I'm hungry. You're like, hey, I'll give you a leftover fry. But you ain't getting the whole bag. And this boy gave Jesus the full bag, all of it, his whole lunch, gave it up, sacrificed it. Not knowing what the outcome was going to be and not even knowing if he was going to get any of the food that he gave away. And Jesus did a miracle. <laughs> he did a miracle. Because this boy sacrificed. I like to look at that story and apply it to you and me and ask this single question. How will you and I become the answered prayer in someone's life? When you give them your fish and your loaves and God takes you and uses you to be the answered prayer in someone's life. How will you be that answered prayer? That boy that day modeled for us sacrifice. Because when do we step into our calling? We step into our calling when we serve others. Jesus uh, gave a TED talk. I, I did a TEDx talk years ago on neighboring and enjoy watching those talks. Some pretty, pretty smart people. But Jesus had the talk of history. And the talk of history that Jesus gave his TED Talk was the night before he was betrayed. He sat around the table with his disciples and he decided to wash their feet. I love Pastor Mike, but I ain't sure I want to wash his feet. <laughs> I'm laughing at that, really. That, that, that made me <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen his feet. <laughs> Have you seen his feet? <laughs> Jesus modeled from them the behavior he wanted them to live. Abraham modeled for Isaac the behavior he wanted Isaac to live. And what was the lineage of Isaac? Think about how you and I model for our children for this next generation on how we want them to live. And we model that by the way that we serve others. That's how we're going to change the world. I have neighbors right now that I will serve before they'll ever say, Jesus is Lord of their life. Think about that for a minute. Who are you going to serve before they'll ever say, Jesus? But they see you. They see you. So will you walk by faith? And will you be someone's answered prayer? So remember the well and walking five miles one way to get water. Well, we had faith one day and called up those well drillers and they came back to our mission. And I remember my dad asking me, okay, Timothy, what do you think? I'm like, we walked to the furthest part of the land that our mission was on. And we found this, this spot, and we were like, let's drill here. And they drilled, and they went down 160 feet, and then they stopped. They couldn't drill any further. It literally was literally three years later after they did their first attempt. And my dad asked, can you keep on drilling? They had hit sedimentary rock. The drill bit stopped. And they kept on drilling another 15 feet, and they finally got through that rock. And they broke through that rock, and they hit an aquifer. And in a moment's time, we had fresh drinking water to the glory of God. Amen? It was a miracle well. But we were willing to do whatever it takes even to live in that season without fresh drinking water. And little did we know that later God would provide a well for us. And in doing so, it became a geological discovery. And because we hit that aquifer, we learned that under the sedimentary rock was a fresh spring. And we started drilling wells all across the coastal plain. We have literally drilled over 30 wells 
and hit an artesian spring to the glory of God. God knew, God knew before we drilled what the outcome would be. So the call on your life today, are you willing to surrender to it? Are you willing to surrender before you know the outcome? Are you willing to trust before you know the outcome? Are you willing to believe before you know the outcome? When I lived in Haiti with my dad, and I like to tease Pastor Mike that he and I both have these, you know, crazy dads of faith. My, my dad was so crazy when I was a teenager, he decided to take me into a boat, and it was a wooden boat, and it wasn't like some big boat. It was like a little tiny boat that had an outboard motor, and it's one of those little motors that you, you, you pull the handle, and you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, he's probably doing like eight miles an hour down the coastline. I'm like, okay, Dad, we're going to change Haiti in this little wooden boat, you know. We're going down the coastline on this little wooden boat. I'm like, Dad, you are crazy. I'm like, Dad, where are we going? He's like, we're going to go out and look for a village that needs Jesus. We And down the coastline, up ahead, we saw these piles of shells. Never had been to this village before. It's called the village of T. Riviere. And in that village, the Haitian men would go diving without any kind of oxygen or anything. They would just wear masks and they would dive. And on the, on the floor of the ocean, they would pick up these Kong shells. And they would take the Kong shells and they would throw them in the boats. And these boats would get weighted down and then the boats would come ashore and they would sell the Kong. Anybody ever had Kong before? Okay, yeah. And then the empty shells were scattered like trash on the beach. And they would throw the shells in these piles and they became multiple stories tall of piles of junk. Just stuff, waste. That one day God would use to be the signal for these missionaries to stop at the shoreline and ask a question. Is there a church here? No. Do you have a well? No. Do you have a school? No. And we promised them we would come back. I was there the day that we drilled a well in Tiriviere. Because we had drilled that well years prior, we got an artesian spring in Tiriviere. They had fresh drinking water in a moment's notice. We planted a church. I remember the first Sunday outdoors. I was there. We preached the gospel. Today, the church in Tiriviere is packed and pastored by a graduate of new missions that grew up in the school that we started there because of conch shells piled like trash on the beach and a little wooden boat with a motor. You got trash in your life? You got junk? Surrender it to Jesus. Because he already knows how he's going to use that for you. And he already knows how he's going to take your life and my life and use it to make history in a lineage. In a lineage. Just like Abraham and Isaac. Their lineage for eternity. Because all this life is going to pass away. We're going to come back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to laugh. We're going to have a great time. Why? Because we're making moments in the lineage of eternity. And we're inviting people to come and follow Jesus. So this morning, I want to make this invitation. Before he knew the outcome, Abraham surrendered. Before he knew the outcome, Abraham trusted. And before he knew the outcome, he believed. Will you and I, before we know the outcome, will we go serve somebody? Will we give away our fish and loaves and see what God can do? My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.